one that's going to be more competitive. If you go read the multi-domain operations concept piece I talked about, multi-domain operations is going to be absolutely require cyberspace capabilities and space capabilities. It's going to drive our adversaries to make it more competitive. And so we have to believe that that space becomes even more competitive in the future, uh, especially dealing with near-peer adversaries. So our, our next presenters is, um, is Dr. Sutherland here? Yes, she is here. Okay, I know she's presented uh, here in this time as well. So uh, Dr. Andrew Ellington is professor at Molecular Biosciences. Um, he's, he's also the, the evil mad scientist who just told us that somebody was going to proxy a commercial company and, uh, and conduct an attack in space. So I, I know where his mind is now. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Krista Soderlin is research, research associate, Institute of Geophysics here at the University of Texas. So uh, Dr. Ellington. Thank you. Okay, so I need to go with reasonable alacrity because I'm just setting the stage for the big stuff, for the planetary research that's coming along. I'm going to talk about xenobiology for military applications. And so first, you know, some definitions. And at this point, you know, I, like my kids, like everyone else, pretty much goes to Wikipedia for definitions. Xenobiology is a subfield of synthetic biology, the study of synthesizing and manipulating biological devices and systems. Xenobiology derives from the Greek word xenos, which means stranger or guest. Xenobiology describes a form of biology is, that is not, and I inserted this, yet familiar to science and is not found in nature. And really, when you work in the field of sometimes what is called exobiology or astrobiology, this is the key question. How can we describe life off-planet if the only thing we know about is life here? It actually makes it a little different, difficult. You know, we have one existence proof, and then where do we go from there? So in this regard, one of the things that my lab does is to try and manipulate biomolecules and living systems to create devices and organisms that have never been seen in nature. Sort of what would life look like elsewhere if it was derived from living systems that we know about but was significantly different from them. So I try and make living systems that are significantly different from those that currently exist. I'm going to tell you about two of them. First is manipulating the genetic alphabet, and I'm going to do that by bizarrely evolving dead things. And then we'll talk about manipulating the genetic code to create cells with novel biotechnological properties. So how do you evolve dead things? Well, the answer in this particular case is if you have, say, a bacteria, shown there, that's producing a polymerase. Now, polymerase is a great little enzyme. It's, it's, it, it zips up nucleotides and makes your DNA and your RNA and everything else. But if it's expressing a polymerase, then it can potentially amplify its own gene if it's put inside a bubble. So step one, we transform polymerase libraries. We make a bunch of different polymerases. Step two, we put them inside of emulsion bubbles. Now, what's an emulsion bubble? If you've ever had water and oil for your salad, that's what an emulsion is. And so we just have a cell inside a cell, so to speak, and then we thermal cycle. We, we, we raise it to high temperature, drop it to low temperature, raise it to high temperature, drop it to low temperature. That blows up the cells, and it gives the good polymerases access to the materials they need to amplify their own genes. So you can think of it as a million little bubbles, and some of the bubbles are filled with good enzymes, green, and some are filled with bad enzymes, red. And we can then move the enzymes to a new place, to a new property, by just amplifying their own genes, putting them in again, amplifying their own genes, and putting them in again. It's basically a self-replication process, not unlike the ones we undergo as organisms, except there's no cell. The cell blew up a while ago. The polymerases are amplifying themselves. So this is how my lab evolves dead things. It evolves new polymerases with new properties by letting the molecules amplify their own genes. Now, what are we going to do with this? So I had a really brilliant graduate student, Jared Ellison. And I will say, and I think we saw this in the panel as well, most of us ride on the backs of our graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. All of the professors know this as, as a truth, but I, I wanted to reemphasize it because really some of the best ideas and the best work, at least in my lab, comes from the people that have worked for me. And Jared was a remarkable graduate student. And he thought, why is it that we don't have reverse transcriptases that come off of the DNA polymerase lineage? So this is the lineage of all natural polymerases. And where most reverse transcriptases come from is from the RNA polymerase portion of the lineage. And reverse transcriptases are enzymes that convert RNA into DNA. They're typically found in viruses. So 
why is this the case rather than having one off the DNA polymerase lineage? It really seemed quite odd because it's making DNA. And so therefore you might think it would descend from a DNA polymerase. Well, Jared just wanted to make a new reverse transcriptase off of the DNA polymerase lineage, which could have really good properties in that it would be better at error correction, would be able to go longer. It wouldn't just be a weak viral enzyme. It would be a powerful genome synthesizing organismal enzyme. And so to do this, he carried out the evolution of a dead thing. He evolved a polymerase that could utilize RNA as part of its template. And he did this over a series of iterative cycles. So this just goes to show this process of evolving a dead thing. Here's the enzyme starting out. And here it is accumulating a few mutations with some RNA template. And as we go towards a much longer RNA template, you can see it's accumulated mutations. They begin to cluster around the RNA template. And so he has created this new enzyme never before seen on the face of the earth, a reverse transcriptase that is evolved from a DNA polymerase lineage and now can copy RNA very faithfully. It could make much longer faithful genomes than a viral enzyme could because it's come from a lineage that knows how to do that. But this has never before been seen. Now, I'm going to segue, not quite too wildly, but a little bit to say, look, all of the xenobiology has important applications. One is, and I, used to, I sometimes describe what we do as sort of intel inside. We're the biology that does the intel inside. We make enzymes so that we can make bigger things than enzymes. We make the stuff that makes the stuff work. And so our polymerases, for example, can be adapted to diagnostic assays where one of such diagnostic assay we've made can look for particular molecules in the field and convert them into a signal using a simple glucometer. And we've actually used this to detect Zika virus down to very low copies in saliva. And so because we make the intel inside, because we make the molecules that work better using the evolution of dead things, we can potentially create new paradigms for how to do field-based detection of diseases or pathogens that you might encounter. All right, well, that was sort of fun. What else can we do with this? So here's some more evolution of a dead thing. We actually stopped here last time, but Jared was no, was wanted to take it a little farther. And so he pushed his enzyme to utilize a new type of nucleotide, 2 prime methyl nucleotide. Now that's not found in nature. DNA found in nature, RNA found in nature, 2 prime methyl nucleic acids, not so much. So he's taking our evolved from dead things enzyme and is now applying it to making nucleic acids that are xenonucleic acids. They, they've never really been seen before at scale. And he was able to do this. He was able to evolve this enzyme to utilize that nucleotide to make totally new types of nucleic acids. And what we're going to do with that, bizarrely, is not make better molecular diagnostics, but do a little cryptography. This is sort of fun. It's actually an issue now, whether we have enough silicon to store all the data in the world. The amount of data is increasing so incredibly that people are seriously beginning to talk about DNA data storage. Not just sort of as a fancy academic thing, but as a real thing. Companies are looking into this. Well, if we're gonna do DNA data storage, not only do we need to encode the information in DNA, but it would be really nice if we had special enzymes that could write special and read special types of nucleic acids. If we had xenonucleic acids, we'd have a double layer of security, both the encoding in the DNA itself via algorithm and the actual fact that you couldn't look at that DNA unless you had my enzyme to do it, something I sometimes called a privileged genetic alphabet. We've actually done this. We had some fun encoding messages, um, including a tortilla recipe, um, into DNA and then determining that we could only read those messages out with our secure polymerase. And we could actually mix the two, and we could only find the secure messages with the enzyme that knew how to read the privileged nucleic acid, the privileged genetic alphabet. So that's sort of, you know, both cryptography and steganography bearing information inside of something so that it's not obvious. So I don't think that this is actually going to be a cryptographic solution anytime in the near future, but it gives you some idea of how xenobiology, the construction of things that may not have been seen before, can play out in many different realms. Okay. And we can get even farther. About a month and a half ago, I was part of a team that put together so-called Hachimoji nucleic acids, double density. We go from four bases, GATC, to eight. 
And these eight nucleic acids now certainly allow much more information storage, but they also allow novel properties, one of which is shown here, an RNA molecule that's a Hachimoji RNA that can bind to and create a fluorescent signal. So this is just the starting point. We can obviously now make genetic alphabets to order. We can make replicable information never before seen on the face of the Earth. Let's segue to the second part, manipulating the genetic code to create cells with novel biotechnological properties. Now, I will no longer evolve dead things. These are all live things. They're all cells. And to just give you some background, the genetic alphabet was GATC. The genetic code are your 20 amino acids from, you know, we go DNA, RNA, protein. These are your proteogenic amino acids up here in the upper right. They're what nature gave us, but they're not what we need to be satisfied with. And so in particular, I'm going to talk about exercises to expand the genetic code to include a selenonucleic acid, a, a seleno amino acid, sorry, and a modification of, of tyrosine, DOPA, which is actually also a neurotransmitter for you. So we're going to make 21 amino acid genetic codes never before seen on this earth. Actually, though, I'm going to go back to some really old work. This is actually work that inspired me when I was a graduate student. Um, Jeff Wong, who I've actually met, um, substituted tryptophan for this other amino acid, fluorotryptophan. And if you're looking, you can see there's a fluorine there in place of a hydrogen. Tiny, tiny little difference, except for one thing. Tryptophan is actually one of the more fluorescent and easy to detect amino acids. And if you put in fluorofluorotryptophan, that signal goes away. What are the consequences? Well, actually, a lot of the BIDS devices that are currently in the field for the detection of spores and other pathogens trigger off of tryptophan. And so this is the incredible disappearing organism that Jeff made. One amino acid change, one novelty, one xenobiological trick, and suddenly you can't see it anymore. And so there is a consequence of knowing about and understanding what these xenobiological tricks and tools are. All right, in the modern era, rather than doing what Jeff did, which was painstaking directed evolution, we actually go in and engineer, either from the top down or bottom up, organisms that are capable of new genetic codes. To do that, for example, my lab will modify tRNA synthetases to put in new amino acids. And a true modern marvel of synthetic biology, the Church Lab made an E. coli that lacks one of the codons that it previously had, so we can recapture that. So we're making a 21 amino acid genetic code on the back of an organism that lost the ability to encode one particular codon. Ross Thayer in my lab did this. And First, we're going to talk about the insertion of selenocysteine. Ross did a great job of evolving machinery that can now put in selenium, selenocysteine, as the 21st amino acid. He was then able to evolve the organism, sort of using a, if I have a small lever, he addicted one enzyme to a selenocysteine, he's going to move the genomic world. And he was able, actually, to take an organism that really pretty much couldn't grow at all and then move it to where it could grow easily in the presence of selenium when challenged with an antibiotic. So again, not a dead thing, but a live thing. We're evolving, and the genome changed over many, many, many positions. This is just giving you some idea of our art, of how we can create organisms with new and novel chemistries. Now, who cares? Fun academics. But in fact, selenium is a really, really interesting amino acid. It can form very solid bonds. And to do this, we basically showed in an enzyme, an antibody, that we would incorporate diselenide bonds in place of disulfide bonds. And the little thing became a rock relative to perturbation by, di by dithiothriatol, which um, is one of the things that you might typically expect to find in a storage buffer. So we've made antibodies that could be used in the field, could be stored for long periods of time, we believe, in the desert or elsewhere, so that you can better utilize them when you need them. You can have them challenged. And because of this expanded genetic code, because of this novelty of xenobiology, they're, on, they're available on demand. And while it's true, I did previously say you can't trust companies because they don't just necessarily want to make money. In this particular instance, the Church Lab, in collaboration with Ross, has, set, has started Grow Biosciences to commercialize the use of a 21 amino acid genetic code for the production of very, very stable antibodies. OK, final little example here. We then also wanted to change the genetic code from tyrosine to DOPA. And again, we did a whole bunch of, in this case, evolving dead things to make good machinery to incorporate DOPA, which you can see because we made this protein that was previously yellow turn orange because it now has a DOPA in its core. And again, fun academics, why, why, why? DOPA is a really interesting amino <laughs> acid as well. And so it forms novel crosslinks, and that's what allow creatures like this to hold tight. You know, barnacles and, and mussels and other 
um, organisms have already discovered this trick of inserting DOPA in order to stick to things. Well, why not? We can take that trick and use it in a bacteria. Why is that interesting? Because now we can potentially make interesting adhesives. And DOPA will make these beautiful little monolayers. This is not my work up here in the upper right. This is actually from the Messerschmitt lab. But again, it's stuck in my head for many years. They were able to essentially dip materials into DOPA to make these beautiful monolayers that can potentially act as anti-fouling agents. I have a colleague here, Benny Freeman, in chemical engineering, who does just that, not on dice, but at sort of the ship propeller scale. Well, now we can control the insertion of this amino acid into peptides and proteins. We can control what kind of adhesive properties might get made, and we can actually begin to think about evolving the materials themselves. Okay, so that's just what we do for a living, but it's really only the starting point. Synthetic biology, xenobiology is going to give a wide range of opportunities and potential threats as we move forward. And so control over the basic chemistry of life opens the way not just to the things I'm talking about, but new paradigms for evolution itself. We believe we can make organisms that evolve more quickly, that access properties more quickly. I believe we can begin to remake ourselves, not by human engineering, which everybody, and especially folks in the military, would, would agree shouldn't be done. Right? I've, I've attended workshops where, where service folks say, no, really, don't augment me. <laughs> but um, if we engineer our commensals, the bacteria that live in us at various junctures, then we can potentially provide ourselves with new properties based on those commensals. And operationally, a consortium of engineered organisms can potentially provide supply chains on demand, warfighters or astronauts with therapeutics, drugs, and power. That's the future. That's where we hope to go with xenobiology. With that, I want to thank the folks who did the work. Again, these are the important people who've mostly gone off to industry. Um, I also want to thank the agencies that have supported me, many of which are DOD at some level. The one I left off the list, I was scratching my head as I made this list. I left NASA off, which is embarrassing, because NASA really is where astrobiology, exobiology, and xenobiology came from at the outset. And I do have some NASA funding as well. But I thank all my funders, and I thank you for your attention. And we segue to the big things. right below mine. No problem. Thanks. Ah. Ah, full, full screen. All right, great. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm happy to be here to present today talking about planetary habitability and focusing specifically on the Europa Clipper mission that NASA is putting together to explore this really exciting body in the outer solar system. So I wanted to start off kind of broadly again with definitions looking at what habitability actually means. So when you think of habitability, what we're primarily talking about is the ability to support life somewhere beyond the Earth. And one of the main things that we do to look at that, at least traditionally, is to look for the presence of liquid water on a surface. And that's based largely on our experience with life being developed on Earth and how that has a really critical um, dependence on the presence of water. So this idea of water on the surface has driven our search for life in the solar system so far, largely looking at Mars as an example, where follow the water has been a mantra that NASA has been pursuing um, for um, quite a while now. However, there's some really uh, important limitations to consider in this traditional definition where we're looking specifically at water on the surface. <clears throat> and the two examples that I want to bring up now are atmospheric composition. And this specifically means thinking about things like greenhouse gases. So if you look to our nearby planet Venus, even though it is 
not too dissimilar from the Earth, the temperatures are much, much hotter, and that entirely is a consequence of its atmospheric composition. So that just kind of implies that if you consider that idea more broadly, you could have other planets and other solar systems that have atmospheres like this that are much hotter than you would otherwise expect. So that means that you're going to have a broader region of space around a nearby star that would be habitable than you would otherwise expect if you don't take that type of process into account. And the other source, which is especially applicable in the outer solar system um, of our home solar system, is tidal heating. So this is basically what happens when you have a satellite, for example, orbiting your, um, some planet, say Jupiter, and as it goes around its orbit, it's being tugged intermittently. And as that happens, the satellite is essentially squeezed back and forth over and over and over again. And this squeezing is a really efficient generator of heat. So think if you squeeze a tennis ball over and over again, that's going to get hot, and it's the same process that heats these interiors of these icy satellites. So what that means is that you can basically have an ice ball out in the outer solar system, but that's not going to be entirely frozen liquid water or solid water. It's going to have a liquid component due to all of this excess heat due to this tidal heating. So it's not only going to have a layer of liquid water, but it can also act deeper into the planet itself, and it can create silicate magnetism within the deep interiors of these bodies as well. This is actually one reason why Jupiter's moon Io is the most volcanically off, um, active body in the entire solar system. So everywhere in that satellite is just like basting with, with volcanic activity, and that's due to these tidal forces. So that's another thing that expands the definition of a traditional habitable zone, because even if you look at these icy bodies, if you don't know that there's activity going on deep within the surface that could generate this extra layer of heat, you wouldn't know that there's water there, which again is a critical component for life. So that expands this tradition or um, explanation for, of habitability. So next I want to kind of move to the ingredients for life. And the three that we typically think about, and this is again based on an Earth focus, is that you need to have water. And this is just so you have a solvent for um, different biological reactions. Then you also need to have energy. So this is kind of a way of feeding any organism so you can support any type of metabolic activity. And the third one is chemistry. So you need to have all of the basic ingredients or building blocks for life so you can build things like DNA and RNA, so you need to have all of those materials in your system as well. So those are the three ingredients that we're really going to look at. So now let's talk a little bit more about icy ocean worlds, which are these bodies that have an outer layer of ice and then a global liquid water ocean beneath that, and then a rocky interior below that. So these are becoming increasingly common in our solar system, and I'll just walk you through some of the, the recent cases. The first one is going to be the dwarf planet Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. So this is, probably has an, a relict ocean earlier on in its history. We have the Jovian satellites. So these are in orbit around Jupiter. So there's Europa on the top. And this is really where I'll be focusing a lot on later in the talk. Ganymede and Callisto. Moving one planet out, we also think that there are icy ocean worlds in the Saturnian system. That's going to be this satellite Enceladus. Mimas, and then Titan, and Titan's unique because it has a really thick atmosphere, kind of like we think the Earth had early in its evolution. Looking out even further to Neptune, the satellite Triton is thought to have a global liquid water ocean, and then even further out, the demoted planet Pluto is also thought to have an ocean in its deep interior as well. So these are pretty widespread across the solar system. So now let's talk a little bit more about icy satellites in particular and why we think that these are such good targets for habitability. So looking first at water, we think that there are numerous ways of identifying water, at least liquid water, within these bodies and specifically looking at these global subsurface oceans. And the first that there's numerous tools. One is you can use the presence of an induced magnetic field. That's one of the primary ways that we first discovered the um, presence of an ocean on Europa. You can do things like looking at aurora and how they behave over time. So that's one of the signatures of an ocean on Ganymede. And the, uh, another way to do that is to look at how the surface of a satellite deforms over time as that body goes around its host planet. So you can basically watch it evolve. And if you have an ocean, it's going to evolve a lot more than if it doesn't have anything so, uh, liquid in between or it's just going to have really small perturbations. So we're able to find oceans that way as well. And on Enceladus, it's a pretty interesting case because we actually think that we have direct measurements of ocean water from its deep interior. So what I'm showing here in this schematic, this is the, the moon. It's not really schematic. It's a picture from the Cassini mission to Saturn. And what you see here are liquid water jets erupting from the south pole of the satellite. So it actually ejects all of this water we think that originates 
from the subsurface ocean. And when the spacecraft was able to fly something like 20 kilometers above the surface and collect samples of this material that were analyzed in situ. And it has this type of composition, which is consistent with an oceanic origin. So next we can move to energy. So this is basically a way of looking for chemical disequilibria. And this is often found along physical interfaces. So this could be along the ice ocean interface. This could be along the ocean mantle seafloor interface as well, because we really want to be looking for ways that you could have energy that um, organisms could harvest for their metabolism. And one of the reactions that we're especially interested in is redox reactions between oxidants and reductants. So oxidants are thought to be produced on the surfaces of these satellites. So you basically have these satellites, and then you're going to have their host planet that have really strong magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are just going to constantly bombard the surfaces of these satellites. And then you're going to have radiolytic processing on, this, on these surface ices that then form these oxidants on the surface which you can't really see in this pointer very well. And these types of materials have been observed spectroscopically on both Europa and Enceladus. So that's one ingredient. On the seafloor, we potentially have the silicate volcanism, as I mentioned before, due to tides. If you have this type of heat and um, geologic activity within the mantle, combined with the presence of a liquid water ocean above it, you could have water rock reactions that basically lead to hydrothermal activity and the production of reductants along the seafloor. And that's been um, supported by models and also through observations of this um, plume material from Cassini at the um, Enceladus satellite. So that seems to be a really promising aspect of ocean worlds as well. And then finally, looking at chemistry, we want to look to see what kind of building blocks for life we have. And again, the spectroscopic measurements seem to suggest that we have the ingredients that we need. And this is going to relate to different observations we have. So we've been able to detect these water vapor plumes. We're able to detect it hydrated minerals. We're able to find carbon-rich materials, including the presence of organics. There's various types of sulfur and sodium and potassium. So the ingredients are really looking promising on these satellite surfaces as well. And in addition to the kind of inherent um, composition within these satellites themselves, there's also going to be a more exogenic origin through, say, impacts from comets that will have a delivery of even additional types of materials that are beneficial for life. OK, so now I want to focus more specifically on the icy satellite Europa and why we're particularly excited about this body in particular. So showing up here, this is an image of Europa's surface. And one of the first things I want you to notice is that there are very few craters. So if you have a very crater-free surface, that essentially means that it's relatively young. So that the surface has been resurfaced um, within the last 100 million years. And on planetary scribe scales, that's like yesterday. So we have very few craters. The few craters we do have are relaxed. So that suggests that there's a relatively high heat flow that was able to kind of smooth out a lot of these geologic features. And there's also been observations of endogenic salts that seem to suggest any type of material transport from, say, an underlying ocean to the surface of the, the ice shell. And looking below the surface, we have an idea of what this deep interior um, is composed of as well. So at the center, we have this kind of metallic core. Above that, we have a rocky mantle. And then we have this outer water layer that has both the liquid component and then the outer ice shell component as well. We primarily know that from gravity measurements as these spacecraft get tugged around the satellite. So what does this ice shell potentially look like? And that's one of the big questions that we are looking to answer. But here is one artist's rendition of what that could, could look like. So looking at water, we think that there is a global liquid water ocean that is about 100 kilometers thick. So it's equivalent like 60 miles. So it's a very thick ocean. It actually has more water in it than all of Earth's oceans combined. And in addition to the presence of water in this ocean, it's also thought that there could be the presence of lakes within the ice shell itself. So that's kind of what's being represented by this kind of um, area here of a Great Lake of Europa that is thought to be below some of these really interesting geologic features we saw on the surface. And the other aspect I want to draw your attention to are these water vapor plumes that we think are being um, ejected from, from the surface. So there seems to be multiple lines of evidence that we have this type of um, abundance of liquid water on Europa. But there are a lot of questions associated with this. One is, how thick is this ice shell? Because we don't actually have a really great set of constraints on how thick the ice shell is. 
It could be three kilometers thick or it could be 30 kilometers thick and the ice shells are gonna behave really, really differently depending on how thick the ice shell is. And then we also want to have a better understanding of does this type of subsurface water exist? This has been inferred through looking at the surface observations, but it would be really great to be able to look through the ice shell and actually find these things directly. And then if we do find them, what, how are they distributed and how common are they? And then the other aspect relates to the ocean itself is how salty is it, which again has implications for whether life would um, be likely to thrive there. So then moving on to energy, as I mentioned before, we need to have oxidants and reductants for these types of redox reactions. And it is thought that we're going to have the oxidants on the surface and the reductants in the ocean. But the main question is, is how do you have these two different components interact with each other? Because if they're isolated, that doesn't necessarily help you. You have these redox reactions, so you need to have them exchange mechanism to bring them into the same location so you could have this reaction take place. So there are a few different ways that this could happen. One is that you could have melt-through events. So this would basically mean that all of that ice melts, then you could have direct clumping between the surface and the ocean. You could instead have cracks that extend all the way through the ice shell. So you could have direct clumping between the ocean and the ice shell surface that way. Related to that, you could also have some type of cryovolcanism where you have more of a gaseous um, material exchange. You could have subduction, which is termed subsumption on icy satellites. So it's basically a way of having plate motion similar to what we have on the Earth. So that's a way to bring material downward as well. You could potentially have diapurism. So this is basically just warm ice moving up from the ice ocean interface towards the surface of, of the satellite. Or you could even just have global scale convection within the ice shell itself. And then you have a lot more mixing of materials in all of the bulk of the ice shell. So that type of exchange mechanism is uh, really important for the um, energy aspects of habitability. And then moving on to chemistry, we again kind of identified some of these biogenic species, and we also think that there could be an influx from comets. But the real question is, what is the more complete chemical inventory of Europa? And then also, how is it distributed across the surface and even as a function of depth? So those are some of the outstanding chemistry questions um, for Europa, in addition to some of the reasons why we think it's such a good habitability target. So bringing all of these ideas together, there has been a study to look at where the most potentially habitable regions of Europa are, and all of them focus around the locations of water. So you might not be surprised that the ice ocean interface is one of the best places to look for life. You could also have it along some of these um, dikes that basically have liquid water going from the surface to the ocean. You could have it in, in some of these fractures within the ice shell. You could have it within this lake that I mentioned. You could have it basically this warm upwelling water or warm upwelling ice that probably has some small water droplets contained with it. And this is also where you would potentially be able to look for biosignatures if they'd say formed along the ice ocean interface, they might be more likely to make it up to the surface where they would be more easily detectable. So taking all of this together, the planetary science community in 2011 use, has our decadal survey, which is basically setting the priorities for missions for the next decade. And they basically came to the conclusion that Europa is one of the most important targets in all of planetary science due to its strong signs of being a potentially habitable body. And because of this, we've been developing the Europa Clipper mission to explore the habitability of this satellite. And this mission has four primary science objectives, and they relate to the ice shell and ocean. So this is basically looking at things like how thick is the ice shell? Is there a global ocean? How do these material, how do these different layers interact with each other? Are there exchange mechanisms? Is there water within the ice shell itself? So all of those types of characterizations of the geophysics um, of the ice shell and the ocean. And the next is the composition. So again, we want to understand what the non-ice materials are um, in Europa, and that relates to in the surface and also as a function of depth. And then looking at the, the geology, if you look at Europa, there are many unique geologic features that you don't see anywhere else in the solar system. So what causes these different types of features? How would you characterize them in three dimensions? Do they vary with color? So there's many different types of questions along those lines. And then a kind of related aspect of that is we want to be able to characterize regions that we find particularly interesting in really great detail to prepare for a potential future lander mission to, to Europa, which would be um, kind of exciting and we need to have that precursor data to really do that. And then kind of 
the, the last aspect is looking for current activity. So I mentioned that there's this possibility of water vapor plumes that are being ejected from the surface. So we're going to try to look for these types of plumes and see how common they are, where they're located, what their source is, and all of those different types of, of details. In addition to plumes, we also want to look for signs of activity within the ice shell itself. So that could be regions of particularly warm ice that would be indicative of something happening of interest below the surface that you wouldn't otherwise know is there. So to do this, we have a payload of nine scientific instruments. So they kind of range from in situ and remote sensing. So I'll kind of walk you through quickly the instruments that we have on board. The first is a mass spectrometer. So this is basically going to be looking at atmospheric composition. Related to that, we have a dust analyzer. So this is another form of looking at composition um, in situ. We have a uh, magnetometer. So this really helps us characterize the ocean um, thickness and also its salinity. We have a Faraday cup, which helps characterize the plasma environment, which is coupled really nicely with the magnetometer to help characterize the space environment of the satellite as well. We have a ultraviolet spectrograph, which is kind of informally thought of as a plume sniffer. Um, so that's another way of looking at, like, say, water vapor plumes along the surface. They're really sensitive to that. We have a camera that has both a narrow and a wide angle component. So we're able to do a lot of mapping of the surface, including getting um, 3D topography and um, digital elevation models and that type of thing. We have a thermal imager, and this is to look for things like hotspots. We have an infrared spectrometer, which is a way of mapping out the surface composition. And then the last instrument is an ice penetrating radar that basically allows us to look at the ice shell as a function of depth, um, which is unique across this payload. So looking at the spacecraft more generally, what we see here is that we have a platform of instruments, and they're all able to point nadir directly towards the satellite surface. And as we get to the closest approach, that basically means that all of our instruments can operate at the same time. So we're able to look at cross correlations between all of the instruments. We also have a, um, a boom for the magnetometer. We have these antennas that stick out when those are for the radar. And then we have these um, solar panel arrays for our power. So I want to take one minute to uh, briefly talk about one instrument in particular, and that's because we're um, leading this instrument here out of uh, UT at the Institute for Geophysics. And this is the ice penetrating radar instrument. And the main thing I want to say is that this is able to characterize the ice shell as a function of depth. And I show an example here from the East Antarctic ice sheet where we are able to fly a very similar instrument over Lake Vostok. And what you see here is Lake Vostok, which is that bright, flat reflector on the bottom. You can see areas where that lake has started to freeze out, so you can distinguish that type of ice that's derived from the lake versus ice that's derived from snow. You can see the rocks on either side, and then you also see these different types of layers that show how the ice shelf has, or ice shelf has evolved over time. So we're able to really look at depth with this instrument. So we also wanted to give a brief update on the trajectory. So we're considering two because we don't have the launch vehicles identified yet. So the first option is to use a conventional rocket. So that um, means that we'll have to use gravity assist in order to get to the Jovian system. So we'll go by Earth, Venus, Earth, Earth to get out to that Jovian system. And that will take about seven and a half years for us to get there. And in the second option, we would use the space launch system, which is being developed. And this would allow us to go direct to Jupiter, which means we can get there in less than three years. So it really has a significant savings on the time spent on getting to the Jovian system. And both of these are slated to be launched in 2023. So we would arrive at Europa in the late 2020s or the early 2030s. And once we get to the Jovian system, we're actually going into orbit around Jupiter, not into orbit around Europa, which may be slightly counterintuitive. If... But the, the reason that we do that is if you're able to go into orbit around Jupiter, you're able to make these repeated flybys of Europa and then go far away. And the advantage of being able to go far away is that you no longer spend a whole lot of time in the radiation belts of Jupiter, so you don't fry all your instruments and your spacecraft. So we're able to do this much more efficiently by doing these multiple flybys rather than being orbit around Europa itself. So what we have is a, about 40 flybys with about a two-week cadence. So this means we have a mission that lasts about two or three, uh, three to four years of science operations. And then one of the other aspects that we have tried to highlight is that we can have simple repetitive flybys. So that also cuts down some, some of the operational costs instead of having to tailor each flyby 
um, every time uniquely. And then taking that together, that I just wanted to kind of give an overview of this Europa Clipper mission and how we'll be able to answer really fundamental questions about Europa, such as does Europa have a global liquid water ocean? Does it have these lakes within its ice shell? Europa has these kind of strange surface deposits. What are they made out of? Are they made of salts from the interior, for example? Are they just dust from other satellites? So we'll be able to figure out what that source is. Then also, are we able to have an energy source for life to thrive on through these redox type reactions? And then together, we'll be able to really understand the habitability of Europa in much more detail through this mission. And I really just want to leave you with two uh, main points. The first is that icy ocean worlds are really promising candidates to, in the search for life beyond Earth, and that Europa Clipper is a really powerful stepping stone in understanding whether we're alone in um, the universe through this um, upcoming mission. So, thanks. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, looking at your complement of sensors, um, the mass spectrometer is a point sensor. And so if you're in, in orbit, how are you getting the sample to the mass spectrometer? Or, or how close are you approaching the surface? Oh, sure. So I didn't mention the closest approach distance. So the closest that we're able to go is 25 kilometers to the surface. And that largely relates to planetary protection limitations. Because if you, you risk, if you go any closer, you risk crashing it, and that's very, very bad because you don't want to contaminate your planet or satellite in addition to losing your spacecraft. And the farthest one that we have for like science purposes is 100 kilometers. I think the average is about 50 kilometers. So there is enough material out there to be able to have a collection through this mass spectrometer. But this only gaseous material, right? Uh, for the mass spectrometer, it's only gaseous, but then we have the dust analyzer that will be able to measure the more solid components. Uh, so the complementary um, set of instruments. What's the basis of detection for the dust detector? Oh, that is not my instrument. I don't know exactly. <laughs> because my, my question is that, that the, from a chemical composition standpoint, it's the uh, having carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, mm -hmm. phosphorus, course is important, but it's also probably equally important the form that it's in from the molecular mm -hmm. standpoint. And I'm just concerned that if you're only you're 25 kilometers away and the mass spectrometer is a point sensor, so what it's going to see is gaseous volatiles, right, that can get to it. Mm -hmm. And if your most of your material is in a solid state on the surface that, for example, your bacteria might engage and they have to liberate it from a molecular format that is not gaseous, then I'm not, I guess I don't fully understand how you're going to get information about the composition and I, I don't know what the basis of that um, dust detector is. Yeah, so, sure. So I can add a little bit to that discussion, which is that Europa actually has a really thin atmosphere. So that kind of helps with, with some of that detectability. And there's also a lot of kind of micro impacts that will throw some of these material out into space as well. So the mass specs team and the SUDA team have both modeled how much material they expect and of different types at the different altitudes. And they're able to, they're, they're pretty confident in their ability to get meaningful um, composition measurements of a wide range of materials um, that are relevant to different astrobiology, in addition to geology um, implications. You can have questions for either presenter, by the way. So um, ask, ask. Um, the, uh, so when you did the development of the dead uh, genome, did you ever Introduce it into a uh, sort of E. coli model and see if it would actually express based on the uh, genetic. So, so the question is, you know, when while we do directed evolution of dead things, do we cycle them through live things? And part of that schema was to cycle them through live things. One of the advantages of creating a reverse transcriptase that could go long distances is we could potentially create new types of organisms that were like retroviruses, but much, 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 much bigger. 
and we have not done that. We have not created our own style organism based upon the machinery of a retrovirus, but with new improvements that would allow it to essentially grow to the size of a bacterial genome, let's say. So haven't done that, but it does cycle through regularly a live cell. Uh, regarding Europa, in the early uh, mission studies, you had mentioned a number of chemicals that were um, s cited in their early slides. How are they, how are scientists doing that? What types of instruments were they using? F they using telescopes from the ground or? So it's a combination of telescopes from the ground, which kind of give you a big picture of a core scale. But a lot of this data came from the Galileo spacecraft for, for Europa in particular. So then we had a few spectrometer instruments on that mission. So that's where most of that type of information came from, was that previous mission. That really just kind of whet our appetites. And we don't have full coverage, for example, for, for Europa. OK, that's going to be the last question. So if you'll come up uh, for your proclamation. This, this, was, this, this late in the afternoon on the second day, real science is, is pretty hard. Those are three really good questions. We were talking about uh, you know, real science there. So that was, that was good. Those are your proclamations, your, Thank you. your coins with Bramer on a chip. There you go. Thank you. You're, you're creating some interesting conversation in your offices. Awesome. Thanks very much. There you go. Okay, it's, it's late on the second day, and I tried this earlier, and y'all rebelled on me.